Well, hello, everyone. I hope you're having a fantastic RailsConf. Welcome to day four. My name's Jesse Link, and I'll be talking to you today about how to be a boss without the BS. When you take the BS out of boss, you're left with OS, which I like to think stands for outstanding sauce, which this dog is clearly full of, and hopefully you will be full of as well. So let's get right into it. What are the things we're going to cover today? Uh, we're basically going to go over the five W's. Why you should consider management, moving into that track. Who makes a good boss? the skills you need to cultivate to be an effective manager and boss and leader of men, when and how to make that jump into the management track, and then finally, where you can find some resources. Now, when I do a talk like this, I also like to cover the things that this talk is explicitly not about. The abstract only gave us a very short amount of characters, so I want to make sure that this is the talk you actually want to be in. This is explicitly not about how to found a startup or how to get VC financing. There are other folks here who can help you with that. Uh, I'm sure they'll be happy to talk about you. I won't really be covering that topic. This is also not how to make your employees obey you. We will only be covering light side Jedi mind tricks. Uh, there are no shortcuts or tricks that, are gonna, that I can tell you to make your employees obey you. You can only work on the skills that we talk about today and try to cultivate your leadership skills that way. So first, a little bit about me. Why am I qualified to talk to you about being a boss? Uh, my company made me get a headshot for our corporate website. This is the headshot here. My mother loves this picture because she thinks I look like a fancy professional lady. I like this headshot because she doesn't know I'm wearing shorts and flip-flops. <laughs> so, take that, Mom. <laughs> so, all business up top, party on the bottom, don't worry. Um, so, uh, I've actually served in a variety of leadership roles. I actually served in the U.S. Air Force for six years. I was a captain, which is an 03 for those of you who know that rank. Uh, when I came out, I transitioned into civilian software development world. I've been doing that since about the year 2000. I also have a computer science background. And I've been in civilian leadership since about 2010. Over the course of that time, I've studied leadership principles for over 18 years now. Uh, the military is very big on training you on that sort of stuff, so I've tried to keep up that practice. I'm currently the director of engineering at a company called Looking Glass Cyber Solutions. We're a cybersecurity company based out of Baltimore. Look us up. We're pretty great. And I have some letters after my name there. So I'm a certified scrum master, and I also have a project management professional certification, which sounds more impressive than it really is. So why make the leap? Why be a boss? Don't worry. It's not all TPS reports. I think a lot of people have a misconception about what it means to move into a formal management role. I think it's all paperwork, it's all drudgery, it's about being the enemy, it's about, you know, being, can you come in on Saturday? But management is about more than that. So let's talk about why you might want to make that leap. Because make no mistake, this is not a job change, this is a career change. So let's say you're a founder, you've started a business, fantastic. So we know you can start a business, it's in the title. But can you grow your business? Can you finish? Can you exit startup mode? To start, all you need is a great idea and some coding ability. To sustain a business, you need to have management skills. You need to know how to sustain your business and lead your people and take your company to the next level of great success. Even if you haven't started a, a, found, a, a startup, you may just have hit your ceiling in the technical track. You may not be interested in moving into a chief architect role. You may be bored, frankly. Maybe the challenges you're taking on aren't that exciting anymore. Uh, and that's okay, because moving into the management track means taking on new and exciting challenges. Being a boss is very, very, very challenging. Now, I know what you might be thinking. How hard can this possibly be? My boss is an idiot. <laughs> he doesn't know what he's talking about. I don't know what she does all day. So let me amend my statement. Being a bad boss is very, very easy. Being a good boss is very hard. Most importantly, when you move into the management track, you get to be in the driver's seat. Now, again, if you're that founder, that's your baby. You have a vision you want to drive towards with that company. If you don't want to take on management responsibility, that's OK. But what that means is you're ceding control to someone else who is going to come in and run your business for you. And you might not like the direction they take you in. So if you want to make and train control over that thing that you started, take it to the finish line, you need to cultivate those management skills. Same thing if you're a senior developer. You may find yourself saying, you know, I don't really care for the decisions they're making. I think I can do better. Then go do better. Prove it. To me, the fifth bullet is the most important one. It's why I moved into the management track, and it's why I stay in it, and it's why I feel fulfilled every day when I come to work. When you move into a former management role, you get to have an impact on the career of your employees. You really get to help mold and make them into the people they're going to be tomorrow, and that is tremendously rewarding. There is nothing better 
than seeing a junior developer blossom into the big, beautiful senior engineer butterflies they were always meant to be. And you're a big part about taking them on that journey. Finally, you get to see the business from a new perspective. Again, part of your boredom might be only sort of staying in this very narrow engineering track. As you move into a management role, you get a chance to touch other parts of the business. You get to see how marketing works, how sales work, financing, how you deal with customers, what happens at the C-suite level. So you get to see how the sausage is made from a new perspective, and that can be tremendously rewarding as well. So as a boss, you take on a bunch of new res responsibilities other than just writing code and developing systems. You're responsible for people, schedule, budget, and scope. So who makes a good boss? What are the characteristics of a person who can move into this track and have success? Number one, you should like people. You're going to have to deal with people in your job. Now, this does not mean you need to be an extrovert. You can be an introvert and succeed at being a boss. It just means you can't be antisocial. If you hate people, that's OK. Keep doing your thing. Maybe management isn't for you. Uh, you should really care about the people you're going to lead. You should care about the people you're going to interact with. You have to care about your customers. So that's sort of a key component. You can't fear conflict. There are people out there who are conflict diverse. That's OK. The management track probably isn't for you. If you are not willing to confront conflict head on, it will overwhelm you and your team. So you have to be ready to get a little spicy sometimes, get a little scrappy. Adaptability is probably one of the most important traits. I don't think I've ever had a project go smoothly and according to plan. I think many of you have probably never worked on a project that's gone 100% perfect and according to plan. And if you can't be adaptable when things go wrong, you're really going to struggle and you're going to drag your team down. You have to be confident. Confidence is contagious, so is lack of confidence. If you don't believe in what you're doing, if you don't believe in the game plan you have, your people are going to sense that and they're not going to believe in what they're doing. You also have to have the confidence to, once you set that game plan, move forward uh, with it. Having said that, you have to be humble. There is nothing worse than a boss who knows it all. Maybe some of you have worked for that kind of person. You can't tell them any, anything. Their opinion's always right. Uh, there's, nothing you can there's nothing you can teach them. They're the boss. They're, they're so much better than you. Uh, you have to have a sense of humility. You have to understand that you're not a perfect person and that you may make mistakes. And you have to have the humility to listen to your team and let them tell you when you're wrong. You have to be empathetic. If you can't understand people, you can't lead them. If you cannot truly get where people are coming from, there's no way you're going to be able to communicate effectively or lead them. Leadership is about understanding people's motivations, their desires, their drives, and then letting them move forward and embrace those things in a productive way. Lastly, you have to have integrity. As you move into the management track, you're going to be imbued with certain powers, uh, certain responsibilities. With great power comes great responsibility. You have to be trustworthy to do the right thing. You're going to be trusted with budget, with firing decisions, hiring decisions, promotion decisions. Uh, if you are not an honest person, your team's really going to suffer, and your business may suffer. So up till now, you've been cultivating your technical skills. You're at RailsConf probably to continue to grow those technical skills, and that's fantastic. But again, this is a career change. A career change requires a whole new different set of skills that you need to start cultivating alongside those technical skills. Uh, first and foremost is the communication skill. So communication encompasses a lot of different things. It's verbal. It's being able to speak to people. It's also nonverbal. 70% of the communication we have with each other is actually nonverbal. So understanding how nonverbal works and how you leverage that when you're dealing with someone who's remote, dealing with them on a webcam, not in person, uh, understanding how that works is very important. Understanding how to write, how to articulate your thoughts on the written paper in an email. We're in the industry right now where a lot of communication happens asynchronously. Pull requests, formal emails, memos. This is the most important ability you must have. You cannot execute the other skills if you do not have this one. You will see the theme of communication echo throughout my following slides. Communication knows, it means knowing how to tune your message to your audience. It's not just what you say, it's how you say it. Understand how to tune your message when you're communicating downward, when you're talking to your employees. How do you communicate laterally when you're dealing with peers of the company, other managers? How do you communicate upward with the C-suite executives? Do you, do you know how to manage upwards? How do you communicate with customers? How do you deal with the other business units? These are all things you really need to understand. Uh, 
You know, I think as, as people who attend something like RailsConf, we pride ourselves on being polyglots. We speak many languages. We're not just Ruby developers. We speak JavaScript. We do different frameworks like Ember. We do CSS, HTML, Java. The list goes on and on and on. The same principle actually applies when you begin communicating at the management level. When we're talking about communication as you move into the management track, I'm talking about domain-specific languages. So the terms that a salesman uses may be very different than the term an engineer uses. Same thing with marketing, same thing with your customers. Understanding how to communicate with those different domain-specific languages, how to mold your message so that it speaks to that person that you're talking to and it really resonates with them is a really important skill to cultivate. Now, communication is way too broad for me to cover in just one slide. I could probably give a talk just about this slide. So I won't be able to cover the whole, the whole span of what it really means to communicate. I will start with a couple of key skills, though, that I think are the foundation to moving along as you uh, improve your communication. And that's this principle right here, which is communication is a two-way street. So when you start learning how to communicate and you start analyzing your own communication style, you should really be thinking, am I an active listener? Have you ever had a conversation with someone and you can tell they're not listening to what you're saying. They're listening because they're waiting for the break in the conversation when it's their turn to talk. Don't be that person. That person is not an active listener. They don't really care what you're saying. They just want their turn to put their opinion out in the world. Part of being an active listener and dealing with folks is really being respectful to their opinion. You don't have to agree with them. But again, it goes back to that empathy trait. Understand where they're coming from. Hear what they're saying. And only then do you respond. There's a difference between being a reactive listener and an active listener. Delegation. <clears throat> as you start to grow your team, as you start to get more and more folks, this is a critical, critical skill. And this is a skill that I think many young managers struggle with. Your job is to make sure the team gets the work done. Your job is not to do the work yourself anymore. You're just one person. You may have 12 people working for you. You cannot outpace the output of your team. When you learn to delegate, you have to set direction. And again, communication, coming back already in the next slide. You have to communicate what needs to be done in a clear fashion. Are your objectives clear? Does the person understand what they need to get done? And this is really hard, because this requires trust. I think another misconception people have is, you know what? I get the term manager in front of my name, and I have unlimited power, just like the emperor. I control the world. I am the queen of everything. Uh, the most important thing to understand as you learn to delegate, as you learn to be a manager, is that you do not have control. Control is a lie. You are responsible for the ultimate success of the project, but you can't do the work on your own anymore. You don't have that control. You cannot make success. You can only put in place the conditions to allow it to happen. And that's what delegation is really about, is learning to become zen about letting go a little. Uh, managers who cannot do this are often referred to as micromanagers. You have probably worked for some of them. Don't be a micromanager. It's very disruptive to the team. You will not be very productive. This is the reason many micromanagers fail to lead their team successfully. Again, part of losing control is accepting that sometimes they're not going to get it right. And that last bullet to me is very important. You cannot fear failure. You have to let your employees fail on their own. I have learned more from the one time that I have misplaced the semicolon somewhere in my code than all the hundreds of times I have put the semicolon in the right place. Failure can be tremendously valuable as a learning experience for your people. So you cannot be afraid to let them fail a little bit on their own. Now, again, you're going to have to balance that out. If you're crashing in a fiery mess, there's going to be a time to go in and rescue them. But you have to let them kind of work it out, get through those difficult spots on their own. And again, that's something a lot of folks really struggle with. Another skill when you move into management is the skill of coaching. So the man in this slide here is Vince Lombardi. Uh, he's one of the greats, uh, great minds in the history of football. I should say American football. I know we have some international folks here who are probably thinking, that doesn't look like a soccer play. Um, so Vince Lombardi is a legend in the American football industry. He is enshrined in Canton. And he is famous not only for his acumen at football, at strategy, as you can see on the board behind him, but also his ability to lead and inspire 40 grown men who don't have to, say, who don't have to do what he says to do. If you get a chance to Google Vince Lombardi quotes, he is a treasure trove of wisdom and insight on how to lead teams effectively. So what is coaching? Coaching is about making sure your people continue to grow. Going back to that previous slide, why do we delegate? We delegate because it's our responsibility to grow the leaders of tomorrow. 
and to continue to grow the junior devs into the senior devs of tomorrow. I once interviewed uh, a technical team lead, and I was asking him, well, tell me about how you manage your folks. I see you have some people working for you. How do you delegate work out? He said, well, you know, I give them, I give them sort of the grunt work, and then they get to run the metrics, and then they, they turn the results over to me, and then I go do the rest of it. He got to do all the fun stuff. His guys got all the grunt work. Do you think the people on his team ever grew out of their junior dev roles when all that he gave them was grunt work? So you have to be willing to let your people grow, even though it means taking a back seat sometimes. Instead, what you should be focusing on is inspiring and motivating the people underneath you to be the best that they can be. Vince Lombardi once said, practice doesn't make perfect, only perfect practice makes perfect. So at some point, again, your folks are going to fail. They're going to do the wrong thing. Uh, your job as a coach is to correct that bad behavior, right? To correct the things they're doing wrong, to teach them how to do things better. Uh, and there's a real skill and a real art in terms of communicating uh, and coaching folks so that they can receive that constructive criticism in a way that builds them up, that doesn't tear them down. There's nothing worse than seeing someone wilt under un unrelenting criticism from a boss. That is the best way to make sure someone quits, to make sure they, the imposter syndrome never lets go of their little hearts. You know? So it's very important that you build them up, not tear them down. Coaching is about having the confidence to set a game plan and then empower the team to execute on it. So again, empowering is a really important word in that statement, and it goes back to that delegation idea. Uh, Vince Lombardi was a brilliant football mind, but regardless of how brilliant he was at football, he did not run onto the field and throw the ball himself. He didn't run onto the field and tackle the other player. I'm sure he wanted to sometimes. Um, but coaching is really about having confidence in your game plan and empowering the team to execute on it. Like I said, learning to trust can be very hard, but it's a lot easier to trust and delegate if you have faith in the game plan you've put together, if you have a good coaching regimen that ensures that your people have learned to do it the right way, and it's a lot easier to let go and let them go do, let them go win that championship. This is a quote I like, it's from General Dwight Eisenhower, and he said, leadership is the art of getting someone else to do something you want done because he wants to do it. When you communicate, as you move into the management ranks, you're gonna be imbued with a lot of formal responsibility. Uh, I like to call that hard power. Hard power is, do it because I say so. I can fire you if I want. Uh, I do not recommend you use a lot of hard power. No one had more hard power than General Dwight Eisenhower. He was a five-star general. There was literally not another person in the military who could tell him what to do. So I think the fact that he made this quote here is very, very provocative, because it's not talking about hard power. It's not saying, just get enough stars on your chest until you can make them do what you want to do. I mean, he could literally put people in jail if they didn't follow his commands. What he's talking about here is actually the art of applying soft power. Soft power is being able to communicate and convince folks to really buy into what you want to do as a team, what you want to do as a company, without the threat of the hard power, even if you have it. Just because you have a stick doesn't mean you, mean you need to wield it. Understanding how to wield soft power is very, very, very important. Uh, lazy bosses, bad bosses, go back to the hard power stick because they have no other tools in their regimen. So really understanding the concept of soft power and how to apply that is important. And again, there's no idea more powerful than an idea that someone feels is their own. So help them, help them understand the idea, help them understand what you want done, and then help them understand why they want to do it. Courage, another important skill. Is it a skill? I would argue it is, because it's really about knowing how to stick to your guns but still get stuff done. Again, with great power becomes great responsibility. As you delegate out the work, the work might not get done but the buck still stops with you. It's still your ultimate responsibility when things don't go right. Having the courage to own that failure is really, really difficult. It takes a lot of guts, believe it or not, to say, you know what, that's my bad. A bad boss who does not understand this concept will throw people under the bus. We didn't get it done because this other team failed to give me something I needed. Oh, well, this employee isn't doing a good job. He failed on it. I'll be disciplining him later, potentially firing him, but it's not my fault. So having the courage to understand where your responsibility lies and how to embrace that is really important. Saying no can be very, very difficult. Just because you have a little bit of hard power as you move up in the rank doesn't mean you're the only one with power, unless maybe you're Emperor Palpatine. But uh, there will be other managers that have power. There's going to be people above you who have more power. Your boss is going to come down and ask you to do things you may not be comfortable with. And it's your job to understand how to say no. And I, this is actually a skill that a lot of folks struggle with. I've had developers on my teams actually come to me and say, I feel very uncomfortable with what's being asked of me by this other manager, but I don't know what to do. And often I say, do you want me to tell them no for you? And they say, yes. 
And that's hard. That's that conflict that we talked about. You can't fear it. There's going to be a time where you have to have integrity and learn when to say no. Now, does that does not mean just being contrary. That does not mean saying no and then walking away and flouncing out away, away from the argument. Uh, again, it really means leveraging your, leveraging your communication skills that you hone so that you can say no in a productive way, that you can move past those disagreements, that you're willing to yield if you're not actually right. Uh, so balancing out how to say no, the art of saying no is very, very tricky, and it requires a lot of courage. When you start to set direction, your employees may not always buy in right away. Some people may fear uh, not being liked. Right? Sometimes you're going to have to do uncomfortable things as a team. You have to have a vision. You have to believe in it. You have to believe you're going the right way. A boss who does not have courage, who does not have vision, and does not believe in where they're going will change with the wind. They will change course at every, every minor difficulty that comes up. They'll be like, oh, you know what? This isn't working. We'll just change frameworks. We'll just, we'll just hire more people. You've probably worked for folks like that. That's not a very productive way to go. People want to believe their leaders know what they're doing. So you have to have vision, and you have to believe in it. Having said that, you have to know the difference between a bump in the road and a chasm around the corner. If there's a chasm around the corner, do not fear change. A lot of folks fear change. They don't want to change their game plan. They get nervous because, well, we've always done it this way. I don't know, you know, if we do it this new way, I don't know if it's going to be successful. Change is very scary. Bringing in new ideas, new thoughts, new processes can be very, very difficult. Um, so you have to embrace change. You have to be an agent of change. You have to be adaptable. This last one, always embrace the truth even when it's unpleasant. People will tell their bosses what they think their bosses want to hear. It's natural. It's very important that you cultivate a culture where honesty is rewarded and treasured, even when it's unpleasant, even when you're hearing things you don't want to hear. I have had devs come to me many times and say, so about that production server. You have to have an environment where it's a safe space to talk about what's really going on. Similarly, don't be that person to your boss. Your job is to communicate up to your boss and give them the facts at all times. That goes back to integrity. Sometimes your boss isn't going to like it. Sometimes you're going to look bad because it's going to be a sign of a failure, but you have to embrace the truth at all times. So we've been talking a lot about people skills, how the art of managing people. And again, that is a discipline all, in, all encompassing on itself. Uh, but what about the project management skills, right? What about managing the work itself? So when you move into project management, what does this really mean? It means tracking work, measuring the work, tracking it, managing risk, and knowing how to report status. That second bullet is really important. Again, along the lines of, of not fearing failure, your job is not to be perfect. There's going to be times where you're going to make decisions and you don't know the outcome. Your job is to understand the art of risk management. There are whole classes just on how to do risk management. What you're really trying to do is make the best decision with the facts you have at the time and then continue to measure that and stay on top of it and say, all right, how does our risk look today? How does our risk look today? Your job is not to do the perfect job for your boss. Your job is to let him manage risk, to give him an informed choice. And again, people who are afraid to tell the truth, who are afraid to communicate upwards what's really going on, those are the projects that burst into flames and everyone's surprised. So risk management is very important. To do these things, there are many techniques you can apply, many frameworks. So you have to like process. You have to be a student of process. There are a lot of different project management frameworks you can use. You've probably heard of them before. Uh, waterfall, Spiral, Kanban, XP, Agile, all the hotness. You can do Scrum. Uh, it's important that you respect and study all of them. And that's that last bullet there. You have to like it, but you can't love it. You can't be so in love with one framework that you try to apply it in all situations. Don't be dogmatic about the frameworks you put into place. There is nothing worse than an agile person sometimes, because it's agile at all costs, no matter what, even when it makes no sense. It's also very fashionable to poo-poo things like waterfall. Waterfall has a place. It's very important that you understand how to assess the project that's been given to you, the people that have been given to you, and then pick the framework that actually fits that situation. It's really about picking the right tool for the job. When you have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. So again, even if you don't use a framework, like I don't use Waterfall a lot, but I still study it. I still look up books on an occasion. I still read articles. I educate myself about the different techniques that are out there. I want to know what tools are available to me, even if I don't use them. So when I see a problem that actually looks like a screw, not a nail, I say, you know what? I'm going to try that screwdriver. There are some administrative and financial things that are going to affect how you manage. And again, it depends where you are in the management chain, how much influence you're going to have over this. 
Uh, if you're doing a startup in particular, budgeting is going to be very important. Do you understand the concept of colors of money? That is basically money that is earmarked for a specific purpose. It cannot be used for other purposes. So again, if you have green dollars that are allocated for infrastructure, you may not actually legally be able to shift that money over. I used to work in government contracting, and that's something very important that comes up in that, which is the, if the government gives you $100,000 to buy servers, you can't say, well, you know what? I'm a little short, and I want to pay some bonuses to my folks, so I just won't buy those servers. So you have to understand how budgeting works. How do you project a budget? How do you do quarterly reports? What is the impact of your outcome, your income? How does salary work? How, do you, how does salary affect how you project? Uh, so those are really important things. That's a hard skill. That's something I struggle with. That's not something you're going to be exposed to in your day-to-day -day life as an engineer until you move over. So understanding how budget works, how money flows at your company is critically important. We talked about the hard power you're imbued with, hiring folks, retention, and firing. It is incredibly expensive to hire folks, which is why retention is so important. There were actually some tremendous talks on Wednesday. I recommend you go watch the videos on how to onboard folks, how to set up a training plan. Retaining talent once you get in the door is really important because hiring is so expensive. Having said that, there will be times where the person is not a fit, and if you have to fire them, you have to understand the implications of that decision. Each state has different uh, right-to-work laws. So you need to understand the process for both hiring and firing folks. That's going to be very important. So making sure you work with your HR folks and get educated on the various laws is very important. I know he said it was an all TPS reports, but it is at times. I don't even know what a TPS report is. I just use that as shorthand for the mandatory documents that seem like no fun, but you have to do them. And that's the thing. You do have to do them. It's your responsibility to understand what regulations are in place, what documents have to be done. Now, sometimes these are mandated from the, the corporate overlords, and I've done that before. Uh, but there are other legal documents that may come in depending on the industry you're in. I am in cybersecurity. Privacy laws are very important to us, understanding privacy laws. If you're taking in people's data, you better understand what you're supposed to do with it. If you work in healthcare, HIPAA is going to come into play. So you're really making sure that you're educating yourself on the legal and regulatory uh, documents that you need to be aware of is very important as you move into management. But it's kind of fun, because this is the part that you probably won't get exposed to a lot. And I actually kind of enjoy seeing these different things, uh, you know, these different areas that I, didn't, that I didn't really get a sense of when I was just an engineer. Uh, a lot of this stuff is really the guts of what makes a company go. OK. So hopefully you're tempted now. You say, oh, you know what? Management doesn't sound so terrible. Maybe it's pretty good. Maybe I've got some of those skills. Maybe I'd like to work on them. I'm ready to make the leap. So let's talk about when and how to do that. Uh, moving into management, uh, number one, find a mentor. Find a safe person to help teach you the ways, a Jedi master that you can go to. Uh, I have several mentors who are senior leaders that I like to talk to to kind of bounce ideas off of. Again, you're not perfect, so find someone who can help you with that. Try before you buy. Many of you are already in leadership roles. You may not have formal powers of hiring, firing, uh, but you're starting to lead people. So look for those opportunities. If you're interested in this, try it out. Say, you know what, I see this project's coming up. I'd love to lead it. Or hey. You know, these two guys, I'd love to take them under my wing, mentor them, maybe be part of their review process. Uh, that's a great way to sort of try it out, see if it's a fit for you. It's not for everyone, but you may be surprised at how much you really find it reward. I love working with people. I was, that's how I ended up in management. I was doing an informal leadership role, and I really enjoyed it, and I wanted to continue down that track. Uh, learning to think company-wide. Again, there are other areas of the business you need to be aware of. So go on a sales call. Go to a conference and help the marketing guys run up. Be a booth, babe. Uh, I've done that before. It's actually a lot of fun. It's a different perspective. Understand how to court your customers. Go help the ops guys. Go sit in the customer support center for a while and take calls with them and understand what happens in the rest of the company. And lastly, have an idea of what kind of leadership style you have. There is no one prescriptive way to do it. There's no one way to lead people. Everyone's different. We all, we're all different, unique snowflakes. The people we manage are different snowflakes. They may require different types of leadership style. Uh, so think about what kind of leader you want to be and then practice the skills to do that. So some of the big questions that came up as I was starting to prepare this talk and talk to some of my peers, uh, I think this is one that's on a lot of folks' mind. If it's a career change, I'm leaving the technical track, do I still get to write code? And the answer is yes, sort of. Uh, I've actually talked to a lot of folks about this in the last couple of weeks, and I've met some people say, you know what, I can code 85% of the time and manage 15% of the time, and that's fantastic if you can do that. Uh, it's really going to depend on the needs of your company and the size of your company. Um, it is absolutely your job to stay technical. You are supervising technical people. You need to know what they're talking about. Uh, having said that, your priority is no longer writing code. That's your team's job. Uh, 
You might be the only person on the team who can go brief the executives. You're the only one. I've had to take an hour of my, out of my day to look at everyone's expense reports. That's not exactly more fun than writing code, but those expense reports matter to the people who are waiting on that money. So you're going to have other priorities that are going to come above that code. Uh, so usually I like to give a little bit of advice. If you want to stay involved in the code, uh, a couple of things you can do. Um, so number one, participate in code reviews. I do a lot of code reviews these days. I don't write a lot of code from scratch, but I do at least stay involved in the code by being part of the review process, downloading it, poking it, running the test, and that kind of stuff. And it's a great way to continue to learn and stay involved. Um, it's very important that if you decide that part of your day job should still involve working on code, uh, I would recommend not working on critical path items. Because again, there may be some management crisis that comes up that only you can work on. And it would suck to hold the whole team up just because you haven't finished your chunk of the code. So look for opportunities of maybe some, some low-hanging fruit, some quick wins. Uh, I actually, just the other day, picked up some code and successfully merged to master um, because I was working some defects that weren't on the critical path. But they got in, and it was nice, and I still got to, to, to exercise my code writing skills. Uh, also, maybe work on some side projects. That's usually how I try to stay involved with things that are going on in the technology. Uh, you just might not have a lot of time during your day job to write code anymore. So your, your mileage is going to vary. I left my last job because I knew at that job to continue at the management chain meant I could no longer write code, period. And I didn't want that. So I went to a smaller company, and I still have about 10% of my day where I get to be in the code in one way or the other. So I feel pretty good about that. Can I still be friends with my employees? This is a tricky one. The answer is yes, sort of. Again, many of you may be promoted out of the very ranks of where your friends are. Yet we're all fellow engineers. We're, we're, we hang out, we go to beers, and now I'm their boss. Um, this is a very sensitive topic. So if you want to be friends with your employees, that's, that's completely fine. But it's very important that you have a system of firewalls in place so that you're separating your personal relationship from your professional relationship. And you have to think very hard about the impact of your friendship and how public you are with your friendship on the rest of the company. Uh, if Jeff, the engineer, hang, hang, hangs out with Jane, the manager, all the time, and he's at her house, and their spouses are best friends, and you know they're doing thing, things every weekend, and, and their kids play together, and then Jeff wins engineer of the quarter, how does that come across to the rest of the team? He might actually be worthy of engineer of the quarter, but perception is reality. So you have to be very, very sensitive to the realities of that if you're going to maintain those friendships. Um, it can also go the other way. I actually had a boss who I worked with who was a very good friend of mine. He brought me onto his team. And we have a very saucy relationship. Uh, he tells me, oh, F you, and I'll say F you, and then we hug and have a beer, and it's fine. And that's fine, but he actually said that to me in the workplace once. And he said it in front of other coworkers. Uh, and he was very incapable, ultimately, of separating how we spoke to each other as friends at the bar from how we spoke to each other in the workplace. And it actually caused a lot of problems on our team. And it actually upset me a lot, because I would never allow a boss to say that to me. And he couldn't put his boss hat on and put his friend hat aside. So I, I ended up leaving that team. And he's still one of my best friends, and I will never work for him again. He's actually a good guy. He's a good boss if you're not his friend. <laughs> um, so be very sensitive to the, to the impact of this. This is, this is, a, this is a tricky one. Um, you can be friendly, but, but be careful. Uh, lastly, do I need to have a PMP certification, project management professional certification, or something like that? And the answer is absolutely not. And again, it's going to depend on the kind of company you're at. If you're at a small company, you may never need this. Uh, having said that, the PMP can be nice. It's a nice to have. It's a box checked on your resume. I've actually had people pick up my resume and say, oh, good, you have a PMP. Uh, but I don't think it's going to exclude you from jobs. Uh, the only exception might be if you go into a very, very large company. Uh, the government act. The reason I have my PMP is the government decided they wouldn't allow program managers that didn't have a PMP certification. So away I went to class. That's why I'm not in government contracting anymore for many reasons. A few final thoughts. Uh, it's important that you self-examine all the time. Think about the kind of leader you want to be uh, versus the kind of leader you're actually being. So I kind of wanted to close out here by sharing a few key leadership principles and thoughts that guide me personally, just to let you know what kind of leader I actually am, I hope, <laughs> on a good day. Uh, that last bullet is very important to me. Leaders eat last. It goes back to that concept I told you about with the, the team lead who took all the best work for himself and left his leavings for the minions. Uh, he was eating first. I had a boss once who, you know, we said, you know what, we want to go to training. We put together a training plan for him. We said, this is the course, this is the location, these are the people we think should go. He looked at it and he said, that looks pretty good. And then he sent himself to training. He went to the training himself. And we said, well, why did you do that? And he said, well, I wanted to make sure the training was appropriate for you. 
that was actually a really formative moment for me. I've learned a lot from my bad bosses, believe it or not. I've, I've taken a lot of notes. And I saw how devastating that impact was on the team, not only because he was eating first and taking training before anyone else on his team, but also the lack of trust that that implied. He didn't trust you to go to training and come back and give him an assessment uh, of whether or not he should send other folks. So it's very important that you put your team first. Your team's need comes first at all times. Lead from the front, what does that mean? It means don't, do, don't ask them to do anything you are not willing to do yourself. If you don't want to work weekends, why should they? they? If you don't want to do the unfun work, you don't want to do QA, QA is unfun sometimes, but I do it because I expect them to do it. Uh, leading from the front is the difference between being on the top picture and being on the bottom picture. Along similar lines, it's not your employee's job to feel your pain. There's nothing worse than a boss who complains down and expects their employees to make sure that their job is happy. Your job is to make their job happy. That's what your job is. Uh, if you want to complain about your pain, that's what your boss is for. It flows uphill, it doesn't go down. A lot of bosses cannot maintain that separation, particularly if they're friends uh, with their employees. So uh, nobody cares what you want. Your job is to make sure the work gets done. Their job is to execute on that work, not stop what they're doing to console you or make you feel better about your day. I believe a high-performing team will always be greater than the sum of its parts. The 10x engineers are great. They're great to have on your team. I believe a team of average engineers truly working together will always outperform that one engineer. I like to call, so everything I do, every moment of my day is really about, am I establishing a team environment? Am I establishing the kind of culture where team comes first? Uh, and again, trying to be selfless is a great way to start if you want to cultivate that kind of environment. Finally, you're never done learning. Another quote from Vince Lombardi. Leaders are not born, they are made, and they are made just like anything else through hard work. And that's the price we'll have to pay to achieve that goal, or any goal. Uh, I've been saying this for 18 years. I'm going to study it for the rest of my life. I will always continue to improve, hopefully. I'm always trying to learn new things, talk to other leaders, read books. Uh, I may do this presentation in a year. It may be completely different, because maybe I hope, I hope it's different, because I hope I've learned something new and amazing about leadership that I can share. Uh, Lastly, I'd like to leave with a quote on, from uh, Admiral Grace Hopper, a pioneer in the computer science industry, great military leader. She said, you manage things, you lead people. The key to being a good boss is really understanding the nuance of that. You manage things, you lead people. You use things, you don't use people. Understanding the difference between those concepts is really the key to leadership. I said I'd tell you where to find resources, so I'm going to put this up right here. I will share on the next slide. There's going to be a, a link to my, my deck, so I don't feel you have to write this down right now. Very quickly, if, you're if your company will pay for training, take advantage of it. It may sound dorky to go to a week-long communication class. There's a lot you can learn if you're humble enough to admit that you have something to learn. Um, there's a lot of free resources on the Internet. TED Talks, there's a lot of talks about leadership there. There's other videos. I'm sure you can go out and seek it. Uh, there's a lot of videos of notable speakers. Uh, PMI is a project management institute. If you have your PMP certification, they have free resources, webinars, dinners you can go to. Um, History is a really important one. We're at RailsConf being like, oh my god, Rails is 10 years old. We're so old. Uh, leadership has been around since the dawn of man, since one caveman turned to another and said, you know what? We got some guys together. We could kill that mammoth. That's project management right there. You stab the left side. That's your job. And I'm going to stab the right side. And our success criteria will be the mammoth is dead. <laughs> so don't be afraid to look. You know, obviously, management, leadership is an evolving art. And yet some of the fundamental things that drive people are, have remained the same over thousands of years. Sun Tzu's Art of War is still studied by military leaders today. Abraham Lincoln, the great 16th American president, has so much to teach us about how to apply hard power versus soft power. See the movie Lincoln. I am the president of the United States, clothed in immense power, and I will have this bill. That's hard power. But then the other scene where he's talking to Tommy Lee Jones, the senator, and he's convincing him, because that guy doesn't have to listen to him. He said, let me tell you a story. Let me, let me show you an analogy about why you need to do this. Let me convince you. Soft power. Uh, so study great leaders in history. Churchill, Steve Jobs, go as far back as you want. Uh, I'm a reader. I like books. I looked up management on Amazon. I got back 900,000 hits, so there are... Plenty of books out there. I will quote DHAs a little bit here and say, beware of books that are diet-esque. In other words, this management style will change your life in 15 minutes. So take it with a grain of salt. Um, these are three books I recommend. I've just read them. And again, going back to that, learning from people in history. Dale Carnegie wrote a tremendous book called How to Make Friends and Influence People, which is really about the art of communication, how to provide criticism without crushing people, uh, how, to, how, to, how to basically uh, influence, influence folks in a positive way. He wrote that in 1935, and it still resonates today. It's still one of the 12 most influential business books uh, I think it was some, some article by Business Inc. Uh, Warren Buffett said that book changed his life. And he's a billionaire, so maybe he knows some stuff. Uh, and then finally, again, studying frameworks. Agile Samurai is a great 
uh, touch point if you want to get into learning about Agile frameworks. And I finished right on time, so go me. Uh, if you want to find me on Twitter, at my typist, uh, learn from the leaders around you as well. I'm happy to talk to you about my thoughts on leadership uh, at any time. If you want to see my terrible public code, it's right there on GitHub. Uh, you can actually look at my commit record and you know when releases are happening because it goes stark white because I have no time to code because I'm putting out a thousand fires. And lastly, you can get these slides on speaker deck. That's the link there. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, I think I've got maybe a minute or two for questions. Or you can clap first. Thank <laughs> you.